Cheers to you guys. It is Friday night, so that could only mean one thing. It is last call, and we are talking final order cutoff. What is going on, Simple Man's Comics family? It is Brian and Jack here. We are here to talk about Final Order Cutoff. These are books that are hitting Final Order Cutoff this coming Monday night, December 16th at 10 p.m. We're going to give you our 10 picks for books that we like. They might be reader picks. They might be for art. They might be for writer. But either way, 10 picks. And we're going to follow that up with additional prints that are coming out as well. But we're going to get right into our first pick. And we are talking Ruins of Ravencroft. Now, this is actually two series. There's Ruins of Ravencroft Dracula, as well as Ruins of Ravencroft Sabretooth. Both of them are going to have a regular cover as well as a variant cover. That's right. We're cheating a little bit here with two different one shots. But here's the thing about these that really makes them interesting to me is Ravenclaw is a, is a institute. It's a psychiatric facility. It's a little bit like the Marvel Arkham Asylum, but it is a facility that really hasn't been talked about a lot within the comics community. A lot of people aren't even aware of it. So I am very interested as a reader to delve into these stories. And, hey, I love villain stories. So we're going to get to read about a lot of villains, Dracula and Sabretooth being the first two. Um, if you're looking for some like backstory and history on Ravenclaw, the great thing to look for is clandestine number one is the first appearance. Clandestine number four is the first appearance of the Modern Institute. And Ashley Kafka, who is the doctor who actually founded it, first appeared in Spectacular Spider-Man 178, those back issues could see some heat with these new series hitting shelves. But I'm excited for these. We don't know much about them other than the tease that it's been shrouded in mystery for a long time, and that is about to change. Now, I've already said whenever a new issue comes out, this is definitely going to be on my pick for Final Order Cutoff. And we are talking He-Man and the Masters of the Multiverse number three. Always going to have this when it comes out. One of my favorite series and franchises of my childhood on and on and on and on and on. But this one or this issue is also going to feature what characters in the world from that 2002 cartoon. That was kind of past when I was really watching it. But either way. I'm excited for this, and I love that cover art by N. Hyak Lee. Yeah, but that 2002 cartoon, The Toy Line, really revived the brand. It was kind of almost dead. So there's a lot of people who really connect um, with those characters and that toy line, specifically the cartoon as well, but the toy line especially. So this is going to be a great issue. And reading the series, which has been a lot of fun, just really has me hoping and praying we get an Into the Spider-Verse style He-Man movie. I think that would be fantastic. I'd settle for animated. I think that would be great. Um, but this this series has just been a lot of fun. If you enjoy Masters of the Universe, I think this is a no-brainer for you, right? But if you've never been a Masters of the Universe fan, I think this is kind of a easy jumping on point to Masters because it's not like it's not real serious. It's not heavy in the old school backstory. And you get uh, exposed to a multitude of characters, right? Yeah, to all, all kinds of worlds. So I, I really am an advocate for this series. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, it's it's a, a great read, and I think it's it's on its way to being one of my favorite titles. Now, if you watched our three up, three down video this week, you know we talked about how Spawn is on the uptrend. And here we have Spawn number 304. This is going to have three covers. There's a Matina cover. There's a McFarlane variant as well as a McFarlane black and white variant. Yeah, and the, this issue and this really, this run have been, and I say run, but I really mean arc, have been real captivating to readers. Spawn is building an army. He's kind of got to take himself from like the depths of hell and really become a hero in the light. And obviously, when you have his backstory, that's going to ruffle some feathers. So he's trying to make people believe that he's kind of the hero that they can count on, um, and kind of keep some of his backstory shrouded in mystery. But um, 
this solicit teases new heroes and new villains. But you know what, Brian? You and I, in our time covering Spawn comics here on the Civil Women's Comics YouTube channel, know you can't trust a Spawn solicit. You can't trust the Todd McFarlane solicit because he'll switch the cover art, he'll switch the entire story of the book, he'll do whatever he wants to do. So um, those looking to, say, get in on early first appearances, beware. Know that it does say that, but you don't know what you're going to get out of them. Getting back over to DC, we're talking Superman number 19. Now we talked about number 17 and 18 on this channel, a little bit of Lois Lane number 7, but here we have number 19, and this takes place one day after, right, Jack? That's right, one day after the big reveal that Clark Kent is Superman. If you read issue 18, you know, it, was, it was, wasn't was the most action-packed issue, but it was a real kind of emotional, humanizing story of Superman. And, you know, Think about the Superman title, man. I didn't grow up a Superman fan. I've, I've never been a major reader, but there are these stories that seem to come around, Brian, at this point, like once a year, that really bring me into reading this series. And I'm on right now. I'm reading it, and I'm really enjoying it. I really enjoyed 18. I don't care about it from an investment standpoint, so I totally enjoyed the issue. And uh, I'm excited to read 19, because now I have so many questions, and you start playing it out in your head, like, okay, He's made this announcement. Now, what becomes of his life? How does this change how he goes about being Superman? How is this going to change his family life? Um, how is it going to change things for Supergirl? And these are all questions that hopefully will begin to get answered in issue number 19. Yeah, one thing about Superman, he's a, he's a hard character to like, right? And if you look back at all the issues that people like, if you look back at this latest arc, if you look back at the birth of John Kent, if you look back outside of the keys of where he first appears, gets his powers and everything like that, the stories that everyone likes from Superman, the ones that are popular or the people that actually do like, are the ones where you can finally empathize, where he feels you got some emotion. He can finally feel like you come somewhat relate to the character. He's not some invincible guy, alien with all these powers. So that's why I like this arc as well. And I'm looking forward to number 19. Yeah, I think the Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover currently going on in the CW, which has shown multiple different Superman, have to, has done a really good job kind of showing you the way that different writers have approached this character. The fact that this character has actually had some different incarnations who have dealt with being Superman and the weight and the powers that go along with it differently. Moving back over to Marvel, we get Guardians of the Galaxy number one. Normally, I'd be kind of like, really, another number one? But I'm excited about this one because it's written by none other than Al Ewing, who you might know from Immortal Hulk. This is also going to have a bunch of different covers for it. But are you excited as I am about this one, Jack? I am because I really enjoyed Donny Cates' run, but it didn't really ever go where I kind of had hoped it would go. Um, the story, and it's tough to say that because, right, because it was 12 issues, he gave us a year, but it didn't seem to have the same long scale that some of Downey's other projects have. Even some of his miniseries almost feel more complete than this one did. So I'm excited for Al Ewing. I'm a new Al Ewing fan. We've talked about this on the channel before. Avengers No Surrender, Immortal Hulk, they brought me into being a fan of Al Ewing, so I'm excited to see what he's going to do with the Guardians. Now, there are a number of variants for this Guardians of the Galaxy issue, as with a lot of Marvel number ones. So, be sure to head to SimpleMansComics.com to check out the article version of the FOC list to see all the covers so you can make your decision when you're putting in those FOC orders. And sticking with Marvel, we get Web of Venom, the good son, number one. I know a lot of fans that like Normie. But I know a lot of fans that like Dylan and Normie will probably be picking this one up just like us. Yes, yes. Let me tell you something. I am a huge fan of both of these characters. I think they add uh, a kind of a dynamic nature to the whole Venom storyline that's been going on for the last year. Really everything involving symbiotes. Um, you know, once you add in kids and all the complications that come with kids. Uh, and then the fact that they both seem to 
have a lineage and a power base that is respectable. Now, we all know everybody's waiting to see what's going to happen with Dylan. And I'm not going to bore you guys by saying this could be the issue. Um, I feel like we've said that, what, Brian, for <laughs> maybe a dozen issues at this point. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to do that to you again. But I will say, putting Dylan and Normie front and center in an issue has me excited to read, excited to check out. And you never know what could happen. Yeah, I'm liking this Normie and, and Dylan because it kind of, it's like the Marvel's answer to the Super Sons, but darker. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, that's, that's a good analogy. Staying in that Spider family, but shifting over to IDW, we're getting Marvel Action Spider-Man number one. This is going to be a kind of an all-ages book, but for me, I tend to like these a lot better, especially if it's outside of Miles Morales. It's really the only Spider-Man book I read in Marvel, some Ghost Spider. But this one always delivers with great stories, and we're getting that Spider Action number one again. And it's right now listed as a one in ten incentive, but we've also known IDW with some number one issues to add in a 1 in 25 at some point. Don't know if they're going to do that or not. But either way, this is a book we like for story alone, but it helps to pick up that 1 in 10 as well, right, Jack? Yeah, and a lot of times, like you said, they, they go with the higher ratios than the last time they had the 1 in 50. Um, but I don't know. They may not be doing this for volume two. But it's great that you bring up the story, Brian. Um, I think there's a, a large misconception in the community about these types of books. We've heard kind of kickback people saying, well, these are kids' books. They are not kids' books. They're what's called all-ages releases. And what all-ages is, it means exactly what it says. They are acceptable for kids, but that does not mean they're not good reads for adults. Think of the way Into the Spider-Verse is for all ages. You can bring your children to Into the Spider-Verse, but how many adults didn't enjoy it? Um, it was very enjoyable for, for most of us. So that's what you're getting with these IDW Marvel releases. Um, there's, there's a more accessible to a younger audience, but at the same point, they, they're fun stories that really harken back to a uh, time gone by with Marvel, where it was less focused on being um, dark or you know having brooding storylines or death, and they were just kind of fun superhero tales. And that's what these stories are. So they're kind of fun. And most of us, or I say a lot of us, do have children. And these allow us to share these stories with the next generation of comic fan. Right. We like to talk about it on the last call because I don't do it. But if you're one of those people that wants to go out there and get multiple copies of this issue to each their own. But that's why we're talking about it on the last call because get those pre-orders in. That way you secure your copies. And then on the day of release, those kids that are a little bit younger, those all ages 8 to 12, it's available for them to pick up as well, and you've already secured your copies. Sliding on back over into DC Comics, we're talking about Justice League number 39. The reason we have this one is Edwin is a big fan of Scott Snyder. He has had a good run on this, but this is actually his final issue for Justice League. That's right. So you know he's going to tie together all of those threads that he's been laying since issue number one. Um, he's getting ready to get back into that Dark Knight's metal type universe. And, uh, you know, this is going to wrap up that whole perpetual storyline. And uh, I think if you've been taking this ride with him through Justice League, you have got to be on board for 39. Plus, you know, you never know what's going to happen because it is kind of the finale of this story before he turns the reins over to Robin and Dee. Anything can happen. Jack said it's Robert, but it's really Tom King, just like Batman. He's taking over Justice League. I'm just kidding. Now we all know next week that new Star Wars movie's hitting theaters, and what better way to put a final order cut off? is that Ben Solo, Kylo Ren backstory. And we're talking Star Wars Rise of Kylo Ren number two. This is going to have a regular cover as well as a variant cover for it. Now you mentioned Ben Solo and you mentioned Kylo Ren. But this one for me, Brian, is all about Snoke. So that's why I am psyched for this series. And I think that 
Clayton Crane cover on issue number two is phenomenal. It's an easy grab off the shelf just for that. But I know all my Star Wars heads are going to be grabbing this. Here we are with another great 80s franchise movie. We talked about Star Wars. Now we're talking about Ghostbusters, and this is Ghostbusters Year One. This is great because we get that backstory that takes place, what, right after that first movie, right, Jack? Right, right after the, our heroes save New York City. But you know what? It's not just the backstory, Brian. It's the perspective that this backstory is being told in. This is a real unique series that IBW is releasing, and they're doing it in preparation for that big Ghostbusters 2020 movie. Each issue is going to be told through the perspective of a different member of the Ghostbusters, with issue number one coming with the perspective of Winston Zedmore. That's, of course, Ernie Hudson from that original Ghostbusters movie. So I'm excited for this one. I think this is going to be just a lot of fun. It's going to be interesting to see like how they go from nobody to major hero in New York City and how they can kind of bridge between say the first movie and the second movie and going forward into this Ghostbusters 2020 movie next year. You and I talked about this. We are excited for this one. Right. And this is going to have a regular cover. There's a B cover for it as well as a one in 10 incentive variant. Then our last pick for tonight, we talk about how we like those facsimile editions. And here you have the facsimile edition of that first appearance of Wolverine. And we're talking about Incredible Hulk 180 facsimile edition, Jack. Oh, that's right, Brian. Now, we've been talking about this one all year. Everybody knows that my philosophy is a first is a first. So the first time a character appears, that's a first appearance. I know the market wants to play games and argue. But it's just that simple. We can all make it that simple. And finally, Marvel has done just that. When we began the debate between Hulk 180 and Hulk 181, mostly for entertainment's sake on the channel, and people got really upset about it, Brian, didn't they? You know, that was the thing about it was we heard from people, well, why did Marvel do a Hulk 181 facsimile? Well, they did it because it's one of the most popular books in the back issue market. But now Marvel is releasing a Hulk 180 Facsimile edition that they are dubbing the first appearance of Wolverine. And they didn't put cameo in that title. They just simply said the first appearance. So this is one I'm excited for. This is one that people are going to be talking about. And these facsimiles are great, all jokes aside, because it gets these books into the hands of people. And you don't have to pay $400 for it. And it allows you to read this book, check it out. So you're going to get to see for yourself whether you would consider this a first appearance or not. I say it is. Um, you can judge for yourself when you get this book off off shelves for what, $4.99? Yeah, I love these facsimile editions. I have a 9.8 181 facsimile, so I'm going to look to get me a 9.8 of this 180 facsimile also. Because truth be told, I don't own the original copies of either of those. But either way, it's fun. It's fun conversation to have fun debate to have and it's fun for all the butt hurt mcgurts to get up in arms about it and with that being said we like we always do after our picks we tell you what later printings are coming out this week as well boom studios is coming back again with folklore's number two the second print and then it's some marvel comics back doing what they do with multiple late printing releases we've got a more hulk 27 the second print we've got new mutants number two the second print We've got Scream, Curse of Cards, number one, the second print, and X-Force, number two, the second print. So there it is, guys. Those are our 10 picks, as well as the later printings that are coming out. But as we always say, if you want to see that full FOC list that has comics, toys, games, all of that on there, that list is available now on simplemanscomics.com. And with that being said, I'm Brian Wood. And I'm Jack DeMello, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo. Remember, buy what you like. That way you'll always be happy with your collection. Sleigh bells ringing. Sleigh bells ringing.